everybody. Um, welcome um, to Pop Music Books in Progress. For uh, I introduced today's presenters, I just want to mark the fact that this is our last session of this fall season. Uh, I want to say thanks to all the presenters, all all the audiences, um, to my co-organizers, Carl Wilson, Antonia Randolph, Francesca Royster, and Kim Mack, as well as a comrade on sabbatical, Eric Weisbard, and also to our institutional sponsors, uh, the Pop Conference and the Journal of Popular Music Studies. Our next season um, is nearly finalized. We will be meeting on Mondays rather than Tuesdays um, uh, at the same time, 5 p.m. But we do know our first session will be on January 8th. It will feature Lene Denise with Imani Wilson talking about Lene Denise's uh, new book, Why Willie Mae Thornton Matters. Uh, today, we have a presentation um, from Tora Storvald, who is Associate Professor of Music at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology in Trondheim. His research on music and culture in contemporary Iceland and the Nordic region has appeared in popular music, popular music and society, and Journal of Aesthetics and Culture. He's also interested in audiovisual studies and film music, having published in Music and the Moving Image. His conversant, Alex Alexis Bennett, is lecturer in music at Goldsmiths University of London and a visiting supervisor at the University of Cambridge. His research interests range widely from British film music in the 1930s, folk music of England and Ireland, via medieval performance practice, to the depiction of climate change in audiovisual media. He is reviews editor of Music, Sound, and the Moving Image. He's also an accomplished per per performer and composer. Um, as usual, we will be um, gathering people's questions, asking you to put them in the chat as they come to you while the presentation and conversation are going on. And then at the end of um, the, the presentation and conversation, Francesco will um, ask you to, if you have this question, ask you to unmute and ask it directly to the presenters. Um, you can also use the chat to just chat and uh, share observations or um, witticisms or what have you. Um, so without further ado, I'll turn things over to Tara. Thank you so much, Gus. And um, thank you to all the co-organizers for making this happen and for providing this opportunity for me. It's incredibly exciting. Um, I'm also very fortunate to have um, reeled in Alexis Bennett to be part of this conversation. Very excited about that. Um, it is quite late um, where I am. It's 11 p.m. in Norway. Uh, so this is usually the hour when I either fall asleep or start raving about books and Lucky for me, one of those things is actually quite appropriate at the moment. So um, before asking Alexis to, to begin the conversation, I will just do a quick introduction to my book, which looks like this. I am incredibly happy with um, Wesleyan University Press and for how it all turned out. Um, so in this book, I try to think about um, natural landscapes as culturally produced, and I try to think about place and nation as performed in and performative of music. So I do view music as performative in a geographic sense, as something that takes and makes place. And in the Icelandic context, music has proven consequential for the way it links nationality with nature through this nature music narrative. It sort of naturalizes culture by equating it to natural landscapes and natural forces. Um, most apparent in my research, the, the sort of main argument of the book, I guess, is the ability of music to sort of stitch together notions of nature and nation. Um, solidifying this nature-nation discourse that has profound consequences for Iceland's position in the global imagination. And that position, in turn, is essential for the economic aspirations of this small island nation in international markets of tourism 
and cultural export. So um, I'll say a few things about how I came to this project. Um, as a researcher of music and culture in the Nordic region, I had for a long time been troubled by this persistent narrative about Iceland as a naturally musical or musically natural country, a place where glistening glaciers and erupting volcanoes inspire elfin locals to sound their voices and strum their guitars in mythic ways. I found these stereotypical accounts to be insufficient and damaging. And that is why I wrote this book. I wanted to get sort of beneath the ice and figure out what was actually going on. Why and how did Iceland come to be defined by music and nature? And what can that situation tell us about musical performances of national identities as linked to specific landscapes? So those are the big questions that I try to illuminate with this book. And my approach to those questions is musicological. I want to explore the, the musical details and the aesthetic decisions that set these broader conversations in motion. But it is a fundamentally interdisciplinary um, project, and I also draw upon the, the environmental humanities to, to reflect on the, the concepts of nature that result from these musical efforts and how they track different ways of relating to the environment. So over the past three decades, Iceland's relationship to the rest of the world has been a highly musical one. Ever since the breakthrough of alternative rock band The Sugar Cubes in the mid-1980s, followed by the rise of global pop icon Björk in the 1990s. Impressions of Iceland have been packaged and shipped out in melodies, harmonies, and rhythms. Despite its modest size and small population, Iceland is known for numerous artists, bands, and composers who have secured international success. And the success of Icelandic musicians abroad has been met with a persistent pattern of reception, regardless of musical style or genre. In journalistic features, in books, in documentaries, we always encounter the same story, that the qualities of the music must somehow arise organically from the island's extreme landscapes. Iceland has for centuries been defined by glaciers, geysers, and volcanoes. Artists and writers have made pilgrimages to the island in order to experience a sense of the sublime or the primeval. And in recent years, the country, country has witnessed an unsustainable level of mass tourism focused on Instagram-friendly experiences of nature, in no small way aided by the Icelandic nation itself and its efforts to develop its tourist sector after the financial crash of 2008. And this history has impacted the international consumption of Icelandic music, spurring tropes that connect music to Arctic landscapes and geological wonders. And that is where I intervene. I insist that these links between music, nationality, and nature are not natural. They are the result of a long history of images and imaginings of the Icelandic nation that have now become activated in contemporary music. What Iceland means for people, both on the island itself and abroad, is shaped by music and music's ability to enliven ideas about nature and nationality. When doing my research, I met many people around the world whose knowledge of Iceland began and ended with music. They did not know much about this island or the people who call it home, but they had heard the voice of Björk or the guitar of Jónsi, the string arrangements of Hildur Guðnadóttir or the piano figurations of Olavur Arnalds. When I started talking to people about a research project on Iceland, music and nature, people immediately offered up their own thoughts on the subject, which were always attached to specific musical sounds 
music seemed to easily communicate complex ideas about geography and nationhood. And it was doing this not through song lyrics, as people's reflections about Iceland were often prompted by the instrumental sounds of composers like Johan Johansson or the incomprehensible vocals of bands like Siguros. So notions of Icelandicness and nature seem to be packaged into musical sounds. But how and who did the packaging? That is something that I explore throughout my book as I place music into contexts of tourism and nation branding. Music is very good at shaping our experiences of place, and it does so by overlaying the physical terrain with cultural meanings. My book provides a focused examination of a small island nation and its musical existence in the cultural imagination. Musical artists shape images of the country and drive cultural tourism. In 1986, before the Sugar Cubes and Björk put Icelandic music and Iceland itself on the map, 120,000 tourists visited Iceland annually. In 2019, Iceland was struggling to handle 2 million visitors a year, which is more than five times the country's population. So there's five tourists per Icelander. Over the course of such tumultuous developments, music has remained the main cultural activity announcing Iceland to the rest of the world and brokering understandings of national identity. The Icelandic musicians that I study in my book use their performances to shift the discourse on Iceland and nature in new directions. And some artists have used their music to excavate the political issues buried in supposedly natural landscapes. So um, one example of this is the second chapter of the book. So the book has um, six chapters. Um, they are all kind of case studies and they, they all begin with musical examples uh, and then sort of use the musical examples to open up a window onto a broader interdisciplinary and cultural history of contemporary Iceland. So I'm using music, listening to the details of the music in order to illuminate cultural trajectories of this um, country, particularly since the uh, financial crash. So one of these chapters, uh, the second chapter concerns music and, and hydropower. Uh, it concerns three examples of music that were composed as critical statements on uh, the development of this big hydropower um, construction in the east of Iceland in 2007, 2009. Um, one of the artists that got involved was uh, Björk, who composed a piece called Nachtura, um, which uh, I um recommend that you check out it's actually one of her one of very few songs in her entire catalog featuring Icelandic lyrics um it was a song composed to raise awareness of the um threat posed to the fragile ecosystems of the Icelandic highlands from um developments in the energy sector um so um, I was planning on maybe um, playing a clip, but I think that's, um, I don't think we need that. Um, but Björk's track that was composed around 2007, it features sounds recorded uh, by this glacial river that was eventually dammed and rerouted to the hydropower plant. She recorded the sounds of the rapids and the waterfalls on that river, which no longer exist. These sounds have now been silenced, but the sounds live on in Björk's music. She uses she uses these sounds of the river to structure her composition, uh, which is a very exciting sort of metrical ambiguity there, based on the sort of circular metrics of the flow of water down this rocky river. So it's a mix of 
uh, vocals, uh, Walter, um, and drums. It's a very uh, interesting track, and it's an example of one of these pieces of music that I sort of get into the aesthetics and the musical analysis of it in order to say something about trajectories in Icelandic society at the time. So this is where environmental politics, um, Icelandic understandings of nationality, sort of nation branding, and Iceland's position in the global imagination sort of coalesce into a fascinating piece of music that is also significant for its ecological aesthetics, where Björk is actually listening to the environment, capturing the sounds of the river using field recordings, and then sort of playing with the river in a sort of musical dialogue between between voice and water. Um, yeah, so that's um, that's the book. Um, and um, I think now, instead of me speaking at length, I wanted to invite Alexis uh, to uh, to start the conversation. Um, so thank welcome. you. Thank you, Tora, um, for that introduction. Um, and thank you for the book. Um, I wanted to ask, you, you, you mentioned um, a little bit about the origins of this project for you, but I, I wanted to ask, was there a, for you personally, was there a moment, can you, was there a moment in your career, in your life where you think this project started, um, your interest in Iceland, or is it not that simple? Is it a more general thing that organically grew? Um that's a very interesting question and i think it's it's a bit of both uh but it was actually a set of coincidences i've been so the book is i should say is based on my doctoral research which i did at the university of oslo um and before that i also worked on uh, music in Iceland uh, for my master's thesis. So I've actually been working on Icelandic music now for about 10 years. Um, and I think it began when actually the first time I visited Iceland was around 2010 or 2011. I went there for a music festival in this annual music festival in Reykjavik called Iceland Airwaves. Um, and this was around the time when I had to sort of decide on a topic for my master's thesis. So it sort of lined up, um, but my master's thesis had nothing to do with nature and landscape because actually I wanted to avoid that uh, discourse entirely because I knew that, you know, many Icelandic musicians were very sort of hesitant and very uncomfortable with that narrative about sort of Icelandic nature music and um, I knew that this narrative had sort of exoticist uh, and romanticist and um, sort of borealist um, um, effects that uh, we also feel in Norway so I was I was kind of um, uh, sensitive to this so at the mm -hmm. beginning I, I wanted to avoid talking about landscape and actually my master's thesis was all about the urban musical geography of Reykjavik and the city itself um, but then eventually I figured out in my doctoral studies that it's actually possible to talk about music and nature in this critical way in a sort of reflexive way and using eco-criticism and environmental humanities to actually interrogate these connections so that's when i figure out a way to do it without sounding very exoticist i guess so i'm, I'm and you, you explore a range of artists composers singers um songwriters in your book was it as as you started writing your thesis and then as you as the, then i'm assuming it changed a lot after that um did was it clear who who you were going to study which music you were going to study or was was this also a growing a complex structure i think i think uh from the outset i wanted to to write about this um 
for me, this sort of defining audiovisual impression of Iceland, which, which is uh, the band Sigurovs and their documentary film Heima uh, from 2007. In the end, I ended up not writing about that film in the book because there actually there is some good scholarship on that film already. Uh, Nicola Dibben, um, Thorbjörg, uh, Daphne Hall, and also John Richardson has has all written on this film. So I actually ended up gravitating towards um, areas of Icelandic contemporary Icelandic music that had that where where um more work needed to be done so I did end up writing on Sigurus but there were a different sort of era of their work um uh, and then I, there is of course that one performance from that film that I do discuss in one chapter um but I realized that um this would be a book where I uh, grab sort of case studies from across genres and across cultural fields. Uh, so across art music and popular music, because that's just how music making in Iceland work. Um, and, and that seems to me one of the central challenges that you kind of set yourself in, in a way, because yeah. a lot of this mu this music is actually quite diverse. Um, at which you know you're 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 setting yourself up for for quite a difficult task, and you, you do it incredibly well um, to 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 draw all these things together with this kind of elusive thread of Icelandicness, I think you call it in the book. Hmm. Um, but also it links to this concept that you you concentrate on much of the time borealism, and I was wondering hmm. if you could explain that um, briefly to us, that, that concept. Sure, yeah. Um, I think the term has been around in literary studies for, for quite some time, but I first came across this term uh, from the work of Icelandic anthropologist called Kristin Skram, who uh, has done a lot of work on borealism. And uh, so it's from the Latin Boreas meaning north, and it sort of um, encapsulates this history of thinking about the north as a slightly fantastical place on the edges of civilization, going back to ancient Greek tales of Ultima Thule, or, you know, the furthest island, this frozen uh, sort of uh, magical realm, uh, sort of in between fact and fiction. So it's all about how Mediterranean and then continental European writers sort of envisioned the North as this place of uh, fantastical um, humans and and sort of otherworldliness, basically. So it 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 it's basically a term that that um, is a sort of northern analogy to Orientalism. Edward Said's much more well-known concept of orientalism so it's about the exotic exotic ex, exotification of of northern nations but of course north has different meanings in different places uh, so you get different types of borealism if you're talking about iceland or whether you know you know north can mean a lot of things but i'm um, there's a specific history of thinking about iceland as this island on the edges of the world map, or even beyond the edges of the map, uh, where you know things can be more nature than culture, I guess, um, and where Iceland is frequently uh, represented as a fantastical place uh, surrounded by sea monsters, and you know there's this history here uh, going back to romanticism, European romanticism in the 19th century and earlier medieval writers and even ancient Greek and Roman writers uh, who um, sort of started this whole uh, way of thinking about the North, I guess. And at one point, you, you were, I think you're discussing um, Olaf Arnold's music um, and um, 
you mention uh, Tolkien, mm. um, as in Lord of the Rings, Hobbit, and I think you used the phrase just just now, in between fact and fiction, mm. which is kind of what his Middle Earth was. And you mentioned Middle Earth, and that that being very instrumental in the construction of this idea um, in our culture, in Western culture, that it you know. I, I, I confess I don't know what Tolkien's view of it was, but um, do you think he had th these concepts? You also, you also, one thing that really struck me was the, the idea of Iceland being in a box on a map, that you would often have a map of um, Northern Europe, but Iceland being kind of so detached, it would be in one of those mm. little boxes, mm. which is what happens with, you know, if there's a map of the UK, you you might have Shetland in a box, mm. um, so there's kind of literal sense of putting something in this category all of all of its own. Um, so drawing together all these 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 strands, and it's it's this is an interesting point because this sort of cartographic imagination is actually so central to a lot of the a lot of the um, reception of. Icelandic musicians in, for example, in the UK press. So I, I, yeah. I have studied quite extensively how UK music journalists and music critics have um, written about the band Sigurós. And um, yeah. you know, Tolkien comes up as a reference, uh, you know, and they, yeah, there's, I think this whole history of sort of Northern exotification is important to keep in mind because we we were now faced with this uh flood of sort of pop culture images of the north in things like disney films you know frozen and also tv yeah. series like um vikings this hbo production and um yeah and, so, and iceland and icelandic musicians land in the middle of of all of this so contemporary musicians now have to sort of navigate these existing structures of of borealism and sort of figure out do they play along you know for um as a kind yeah. of strategic essentialism or do they try their best yeah. to oppose these narratives and sort of circumvent them and try to develop more cosmopolitan identities and, and so there are different strategies for kind of dealing with this i think and it's complex because you know clearly some artists are fully aware of uh, of signing up to this identity con constructing this identity mm. uh, even bjork who works on so many levels um yeah. that that track i think it's called aurora from vespertine mm. which you used to you, you you discuss at one point uh, with the, the where she uses the sound of trudging in snow as a rhythmic and mm. she uses words like glacier and mm. um aurora um uh and i want i could could you say something about is it having studied some of these artists do you, do you get a sense that some some of them are conflicted by this or some of them are happy with yeah this element i think i think a lot of um many musicians now in in iceland are very conflicted about this but it's a bigger it's a bigger sort of structure of sort of nation branding that actually has taken over or sort of colors all cultural activity in Iceland right now, uh, especially since the the crash. There's been this massive buildup of tourism, and everything is all about bringing tourists to the island, which means maintaining a sort of attractive image of the nation, which means relying on cultural export, including the export of popular music, for sort of mm -hmm. selling the idea of Iceland as a cool, vibrant hotspot of, of culture uh, and the government the Icelandic government has realized the value of uh, music for maintaining this image of the nation as a destination so it's um, not really 
nationalism or sort of destinationalism uh, that doesn't work uh, but um from nation to destination could be a, a sort of chapter heading i guess yeah. um yeah so it's it's all about it's no longer sort of domestic nation building but it's sort of external nation branding and sort of promoting the nation and they've they've realized the value for music um the value of music so now there are so many um government programs for you know funding for young musicians musicians who want to go on tour they can apply for money not only from the government but also from commercial um or organizations like the national airline iceland air who is the biggest sponsor of this big music festival and they also allow icelandic musicians musicians to bring their instruments on the play on flights free of charge um so and there's so many sort of Icelandic showcase concerts being organized around Europe and the North America. So if musicians are willing to sort of play the part and participate in nation branding, they get this sort of state support. They get a sort of, um, uh, and they can go down this already paved road of, of state funding and it's it's very easy. So if you want to do something else and sort of resist this whole machinery of, of national identity, um, you ha it's it's more difficult and you you um, you have to do things more sort of independent, I guess. But uh, you mentioned Björk and and that's interesting because Björk is doing so, and many others as well are doing so interesting creative things with with uh, with natural imagery and sort of ideas about nature in music but the problem is that these very exciting things are very quickly co-opted by marketing forces and reduced to a sort of exoticism or reduced to a sort of poster for the nation when in reality yeah. there there's more to it you know hmm. and and even some sometimes i know that she she's been reduced to her looks um the the way she looks as being somehow a kind of almost like a branding for uh nationhood and um I, I, I don't know if you ever came across anything about whether she said anything about that but that's kind of interesting as well uh, absolutely there's a lot um there's a lot there um in my book uh Björk is is sort of plays a minor role I guess she's um and that's also because there's a lot of really good scholarship on Björk um, yeah. ready. So, you know, the best, in my opinion, is probably Nicola Dibbon's monograph on Björk. Mm. Um, but yeah, that book is from 2009. So there's an entire decade or 15 years of Björk's career that's not covered. So we need an, another one. Uh, we need a new monograph on Björk, I guess, eventually um but um yeah there's um and again Birk has a very particular relationship with especially uk journalists i don't know why it's the uk critics but they they have a history of 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 of, of writing about Birk in certain ways that are not the best ways <laughs> to say the least yeah i wanted to ask um you the way you've constructed this book um you bring in a lot of um history economic history political history and even even geological moments of icelandic uh history so for example the eruption in laki is it laki or laki mm. um in uh, 1783 which I'd never I'd never heard of before, but um, is clearly one of the key moments in Icelandic history, mm. um, all the way up to the economic crash of two thousand and eight. Mm. And I wonder if is this did, did this project particularly invite that kind of musicology, or um, mm. do you, is that your musical is that your methodology? If you, is, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Um the actually it's not necessarily my 
my musicology i think i'm not sort of a historical person uh but it's rather the fact that uh when trying to study cultural aspects of contemporary iceland i realized the importance mm -hmm. of history and and particularly you know census of history which is uh how kimberly kennedy uh, an ethnomusicologist who has written great stuff on iceland she talks about you know the weight of history the importance of history and if you visit Reykjavik today you are sort of surrounded by performance of history so you can go to the the settlement exhibition which is this new digital um, museum where you know sort of iceland in the ninth century is recreated um and sort of history is everywhere um and this has to do with Ironically, it has to do with history, I guess, why history is so important uh, in contemporary Iceland, because this was actually part of the independence struggle, you know, at the beginning of the 20th century, when Icelanders felt the need to establish their own independent nation, they did so by looking back to the sort of golden age of the Viking age, sort of the pre-Danish period when Iceland had been an independent state and they sort of built the modern nation on top of its history. Um, and, and this historical continuity has been performed and it sort of continuously kept alive. Uh, and it's so important part of Icelandic culture today. Uh, people, um, you know, just pe people love to sort of drive around and sort of look at these historical sites uh you know moments from the saga literature that you you can see in in the landscape and things like that are so incredibly important so and also in in contemporary political rhetor rhetoric the past is always invoked um so i quickly discovered the importance of of history so i i sort of needed to to include those perspectives to make sense of uh, Iceland now, I guess, uh, because you know this I'm is just, not, just you know just today. I, as someone mentioned already before we started the the eruption mm. last night. Um, was it last night? Yeah, you know, yeah. in indicative of the the constant change in Iceland's ge geology, um, mm. and and. Two central images in the book are of fire and ice. Um, that seem to me these great images of not only Iceland's landscape, land, the geology, but but also and and I wondered this, um, the fact that climate change studies, climate environmentalism is close, but. I'm sorry, you you froze. Um, Where do your research go next? Do you... Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think I heard. I think I heard your question. Um, so you 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 froze there for for a minute, but um, so I'll I'll choose to hear your question as uh, where my research is going next, and. Uh, um, as you are well aware, um, I am contributing a chapter to the anthology that you are currently co-editing called Climate Change in Audio Audiovisual Media, which is forthcoming with Bloomsbury, which is set to be very exciting. So my sort of interest in eco-criticism and I guess the sort of eco-musicological um, analysis was really sparked by this study of music in Iceland when I realized the importance of concepts of nature for defining the musical experience both for artists and 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 listeners um so I'm 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 continuing my interest in music and nature um having now published the book um I actually and having spent you know 10 years working on Iceland I actually felt sort of sick and tired of Iceland for a while. And I thought, you know, 
I'm not going to research Iceland for a while. But then, you know, as it happens, you know, the book has sort of opened up new opportunities and you um i've um i've now after you know releasing the book and promoting the book in iceland i've sort of that has opened up some new opportunities some new contacts uh, doors that were closed to me for a long while now people are sort of more eager to talk and so now it's actually easier for me to to continue my research on iceland so i'm also happy to I think I'm not, I, I might be allowed to announce that I will be writing a tiny book, a, a 33 and a third book on this um, album, Auge Tispirion, which was the breakthrough album of Sigros. Just now starting to think about that. So, you know, um, so that's definitely at least two years until I'm supposed to submit the manuscript. So it's it's a it's a while. Um, but I'm doing doing some more work on Sigros um, as well. Um, but yeah, definitely interested in contemporary music and culture uh, and nature and its relationship with ecology. Um, started teaching this as well at my university. I've been lucky to get the opportunity to to do a course on ecomusicology. So, um, yeah, that's that's where I'm at currently. <laughs> so also, would you like to take this opportunity to say something about that uh, anthology and also your your work um, at the moment? Uh, I can take. Yeah, thank you. I'll take 30 seconds. Um, uh, I've teamed up with John Richardson and Annette Davis and John is in Finland and Annette is in Edinburgh um, and we are producing for Bloomsbury a collection of chapters um, to do with uh, climate change in audiovisual media and broadly speaking um, that can range from uh, films, uh, feature films and uh through to documentaries to nature programs to um marketing for fossil fuel companies to pr promotion and activist videos and um yeah so the whole range and and looking at music and sound and how those operate in in that media um and and it's 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 actually a departure for me because my background is in film music and in various other kinds of music and um but looking on the kind of uh, eco musicology eco criticism is is relatively new for me and um it's really exciting i'm really happy to be doing it um so i think we should go into some questions now if that's okay tora yes that's yeah absolutely terrific um well, hopefully, hopefully everyone will um add their questions to the chat. Um, and the first question is actually mine. Um, I will take the liberty of asking it, which is, um, Tora, I was just thinking about your your dissertation on urban uh, music and, and Reykjavik and wondering mm -hmm. if that snuck into this book or in other ways informed the book. Yes, it did. And um one of the main insights there was looking at the sort of cultural fields of uh, musical production and the sort of musical institutions in Reykjavik. And I noticed that they're, they're really like porous boundaries between art music and, and popular music. And this has to do with sort of the structures of education, music education in Iceland, and also just the, the demographic the fact that it's a tiny population so if you want to if you want to survive as a professional musician you have to do all sorts of gigs across all genres so it's not unusual that you have the same people playing in the symphony orchestra are also playing in rock bands um, and that sort of cross genre fluidity and cross hierarchy fluidity um, led me to to really study 
contemporary Icelandic music from across all genres, basically, because it's the same people who are, um, you know, someone like Hildur Gudnadottir, who is now sort of the at the top of the film music world as a film music composer, has also, you know, played cello in, in experimental rock bands. And, um, you know, there's... And so many of the musicians that I study in the book are sort of moving fluently between all types of genres. So, and that insight came from studying the sort of um, the musical institutions, the educational institutions in Reykjavik, noticing that all, all the people have sort of passed through the same institution, which is the Arts Academy, um, which is, is the only sort of um, higher education in composition uh, and performance in Iceland. Um, yeah, so I guess it, it, it informed some of my methodological choices, actually, um, if that answers your question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you. Thanks for that. Um, let's see, we had some, some comments, um, but John, um, Vandervert, you had a question and maybe, um, yeah, I encourage everyone to keep writing their, their comments and questions down, but John. Yeah, uh, you can hear me. Yes. Okay. I'm going to assume this. Okay. Um, well, thank you. This has been very, very interesting. Um, so I study at Uppsala university, so it's interesting to yeah, the Icelandic music music scene. Um, so I'm just scrolling back to try to find my question. Um, ah, yeah, okay, here it is. Okay, so my question then uh, relates to sort of the the let's see, like the mechanics of self exotification, something that you mentioned. But then I was fascinated by what you had said: the exotific. Oh my gosh, this word exotification or ex or the sort of Orientalism coming from mm. the top down. I thought that was very interesting because I deal with Russia, but it's mm. it, this sort of Orientalism comes from the musicians and the composers rather than the government. So mm. I was wondering how that sort of influences the dynamics within a country like Iceland where the sort of Orientalism is coming from the government itself. Mm. Um, and so then the, I don't know, I would assume that the musicians and the composers can't really escape it because the... Yeah. The government setting the narrative so i'm just curious if you could sort of elaborate oh definitely definitely um and this has been covered uh very well by the icelandic anthropologist kristin loftstofter who uh she has this monograph from a couple of years back called creating exotic iceland um and it's all about how iceland is kind of leaned very heavily into tourism uh, over the past few decades. And it's definitely a sort of self-exotification from the governmental level that this is now the, the primary economic strategy actually is, is to build an attractive destination. So that sort of influences all everything else in, in society. And like I mentioned at in my short introduction, um, it's really an unsustainable level of mass tourism that is now uh, that Icelanders are struggling with. And now they've actually started to take measures because there's it's just too much. Um, you know, there's tourists working in the tourism industry, too, because there's, you know, there's too, there's not enough people to. Um, so uh, it wasn't you you had an interesting angle here you know the the relate the dynamics between the top level um sort of nation branding and then the musicians themselves and their self exotification it would be interesting to study the 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 sort of dynamics there and how those two levels um work together um and that that might be absolutely something i could uh, think more about because i i don't think i've explored that in that way uh, so that's so thank you for that okay well i'll look for your next book so there we go so thank you very much i appreciate it. antonia um would you like to talk a little bit about your your comment in terms of thinking about um well yeah you can talk about it yeah sure thank you for a really interesting discussion um my only um connection to icelandic music is Björk as I think it's true for some people from the US. And I was thinking about how Iceland is constructed as this 
as this white and austere place, but the white is actually also racialized. And when I was growing up in the 90s and a fan of Bjork, the contrast between Bjork and her collaborators like Goldie and Tricky, who are in musics like Jungle, especially something like Jungle and Trip Hop, mm -hmm. um, you know, music writers were playing on that contrast between the white um, barren north of Iceland and Jungle and Trip Hop and its association with urban, but also black bodies. Um, have you thought a little bit about those kind of racialized associations? Yes. Um, thank you for wonderful uh, insight there, connecting the sort of the aesthetics of whiteness in the sort of audiovisual and musical constructions of Iceland to whiteness as in the, the sort of racial discourse. Um, that's actually something that I haven't touched on in the book. Um, I must admit that I'm not competent to 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 speak to that. Um, unfortunately, all the musical examples in my book are white musicians. Uh, that's the overwhelming majority. Uh, I mean, Iceland is a particularly homogenous population, uh, quite uniquely so in, in, in a global context. It's a tiny population of 350,000 people. Um, but there are some interesting uh, histories and some interesting work on race in Iceland. Um, for example, um, the wonderful anthropologist Gisli Paulson has this book where he studies the history of the first black person in Iceland, which was actually a slave in Copenhagen who managed to escape to Iceland on a boat somehow and who ended up um, having actually fathering children in Iceland. And then that became a big thing um, because genetics has also been an uncomfortably important thing for the Icelandic population um, we, in some very icky ways. Uh, but um, yeah, um, the music scene in Iceland is getting more diverse there are some examples of of um icelanders of uh, non-western origin and, and so forth but um in general iceland is a uniquely homogenous population so uh, it's definitely ripe for some um work from that angle but i have not done that work um but i hope that some people would do that um absolutely That's really fascinating. Um, Gus also had a question that was connected in many ways. Yeah, I mean, this was just really prompted by Antonia's comment and um, uh, and yeah, just curious. I mean, I, I, I in my previous incarnation as a scholar, I, I was a 19th century American lit scholar, American literature scholar and um, I, um, in the course of writing a book, uh, discovered this um, kind of craze among um, Northeastern aesthetes and intellectuals for Nordic literature and including Icelandic sagas specifically. Um, and this was at the same time as uh, Barnum had brought Jenny Lind from Sweden, who, you know, was this massive um, sensation. And then it's also this, this is the 1850s and so it's the decade in which the minstrel show is becoming this massive phenomenon at the same time as well as the ongoing crisis over slavery and you, and you just get this sense that sort of this section of americans like pretty elite americans are sort of projecting onto the northlands this kind of whiteness that's pure and not sort of tainted by mm. um by the presence of enslaved people, you know, and, and, yeah. and slavery. Um, mm -hmm. And I guess, I don't know, I, I, it sounds like, you know, this is something you're, you're sort of still thinking about as maybe not part of your, your book, but, um, you know, I was just wondering if there's any kind of dynamic mm -hmm. or in these projections that you're talking about that does have to do with race or like, and, and mm -hmm. maybe current immigration patterns in Europe or something like that. I mean, I wouldn't want to make a heavy handed, yeah. you know, cause no. and effect thing but it seems interesting 
I think you're onto something very you're onto something very uh, real there when it comes to not not only American sort of intellectuals projecting various ideas onto Iceland, but this is also a, a European history and particularly a German history. Um, you know, the Nazi sort of intellectuals of the 1930s and 40s had a very particular relationship with Iceland. Iceland was this considered a sort of deep freeze of, of sort of untainted um, Aryan uh, sort of genetics and culture um and even even you know danish uh intellectuals in the 19th century had this uh, idea of icelanders as being a sort of the sort of original norse uh culture so i think this was a and that was a very strange situation where you had sort of both the colonizer and the colonized actually believing that the colonized was cu culturally superior and racially superior to the colonizer, which is a very strange situation, but it's, that was actually, <laughs> yeah. Um, so there's, there's this history of, of thinking about, um, and this is part of Borealism. It's part of like the, the thinking about the North as pure, which has become a sort of uh, difficult and damaging thing uh, in contemporary far-right uh, neo-Nazi discourse as well. You know, one of my supervisors was um, Kimberly Kennedy, who is an ethnomusicologist who has written on Icelandic traditional music. Um, I write on Icelandic contemporary music, so it's it's a bit different. But when she gives sort of public talks, she she told me that you know she's always there's always one or two people at the back with you know, the, the tattoos and the sort of the the runic alphabet and sort of people seeking um, or people who are into sort of Iceland for strange reasons, you know. Um, so there, there's there's something there that's still part of contemporary thinking about Iceland as well. I think. Wow, thank you, thank you. Um, let's see, Carl, do you, would you like to ask your question about economics? Yeah. Um, thanks so much. This is um, really fascinating, um, especially um, as a partially a descendant of the Icelandic diaspora in Canada. Oh, um, yeah. This is fascinating to me. Um, and also, you know, Canada has some of the same issues about northernness and perception on that level. Um, but what was what really strikes me is that like over the past three decades, I would say, Iceland has been through like an incredible amount of upheaval and transformation, mm -hmm. you know, first the economic boom and then the crash and the transformation from a sort of resource economy to a finance economy and then to a tourist economy mm. and and the and you know the tourism boom and i'm wondering if there are specific examples of how you know th partly perhaps through this language of landscape and music um mm. specific artists have created some kind of critical discourse about dealing mm. with all of that I, i'm just curious yeah Absolutely. Um, and this is something I go into in the first couple of chapters in the book where um, the financial crash of 2008 is sort of a, a, a fulcrum. Um, and I, I do an analysis of, of a, an, a song called Stingham Av or Let's Slip Away by a sort of folk rock, indie rock uh, artist called Mugison. And this became a sort of hit song right after the crash in this period of crisis where there was a lot of question regarding Iceland's uh, sort of position in the world and sort of Icelandic identity and what have we become, you know, the uh, sort of nation of financial criminals. And there was a lot of a sense that Icelandic history and Icelandic culture was being lost. And, and then along comes this sort of folk rock artist with his acoustic guitar and sort of sings this lullaby-esque song about um, 
about landscape and sort of traditional ways of living, which becomes incredibly popular. It was like the um, sort of best selling and most listened to song uh, in Iceland for a few years. So that I sort of build my analysis around that song. And also there's other examples in the book of musicians who are use their music to sort of critically interrogate just the general trajectory of Icelandic society um, in the 2000s and 2010s in many different ways. And I um, and a lot of these issues also come up in some of the audiovisual productions that I analyze, including there's one chapter on music in Nordic noir television, so crime television. Uh, so and that's also a genre and a sort of aesthetics where there's room for for sort of societal criticism of that kind and the music also plays into that so that's absolutely a history that is illuminated by the musical examples that I study and just to I'm sorry to piggyback on my own question but the part of it I forgot to mention is does that shade into um ways of addressing climate crisis as a thing that uh, you know for an island nation and particularly for a northern ireland nation are is a particularly intense threat yeah. compared to elsewhere yeah so because of this sort of deep set ideological structure where nation and nature is sort of sandwiched together so there's this close link between landscape and identity which means that any sort of perceived threat to the landscape is a per perceived threat to Icelandicness and what it means to be Icelandic and what this nation is all about. So, and there's some potential there, but also it's also, it's also a bit unfortunate that environmental politics becomes sort of nationalism in a way, in, in that um, cultural heritage becomes the dominant framing of environmental issues. Uh, that you know this is a threat to a unique uh sort of natural cultural heritage the the glaciers and and sort of and also people talk about it it being a you know climate change causing the melting of the glaciers will make the tourists stop coming and sort of it's all the wrong arguments but it's <laughs> so definitely there are aspects to Icelandic national identity that inflects the climate change discourse in in a sort of nationalist way i think thank you very much catherine with a question from catherine parish hello hello um bright light uh thank you for this wonderful discussion um i want to quickly insert an example into John Shaw's question that's coming up about um, other uh, cultures, countries, and, and musicians from those places that have um, struggled with uh, Borealism. Um, and just to say, and I'm not sure if you know, um, that in Canada there was, maybe still is, Carl, I'm sure will we'll, uh, inform, of uh, a uh, small well, for Canada, actually not so small, folk music uh, label called Borealis. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, you know, hmm. uh, anyway, just to add that to a question coming up that I think is a really good question. I was really interested in when you were sharing earlier on about the fact that your own interest in Iceland and Icelandic music um, began with you as a tourist going to a music festival mm. Um, mm. and you know and, and so i wondered i wondered if you've written about that explored that if you've included that in mm -hmm. the, in, in the story and mm. like and in addition to that you know if somebody and please forgive my mispronunciation of your name but if somebody told me hey have you listened to the latest album by segura ross it's called tor Storvold. I'd say sure, um, meaning you know you you could pass, um, and so there's so again that's a part of the relationship. How your personal relationship to uh, to Iceland and mm. your position telling the story, I'd love to hear about that. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, this is something that I've discussed a lot with my colleagues in in Iceland. Uh, so over the um, these past a uh, few years, I've also been working um, quite a bit in Iceland, teaching both at the University of Iceland, but also at the Arts Academy and the music department there. And um, been in, in touch with, you know, sort of Icelandic scholars of music um, a lot, uh, of course, sort of talking to people about um, me coming there as a non Icelander um um you know and mostly I think people have been very welcoming and have been very okay with that um basically because I think this is also part of um a sort of Icelandic mentality that's shaped by certain um cultural aspects and certain demographic aspects that they are incredibly because of this tiny population again it comes back to the tiny population. People are fully aware that they are dependent on international people coming to Iceland, working, working with Icelanders, and it's a it's very much a culture where people are passing through all the time, especially in academia there. Um, but yeah, I do um, I do explore this a bit in the book, but not not not. Probably not enough uh, now that you uh, pose the question in that way. Um, probably it has to do with, um, you know, so my book is not primarily an ethnographic one. Um, it's, but uh, there is some ethnography, uh, but it's, that's not the main method. Uh, but of course, uh, I've spent a lot of time there talking to the people, learn the language and so forth, but it's not, I wouldn't call my work ethnomusicology. So um, that also means that I've probably managed somehow to avoid having the most, those sort of difficult <laughs> conversations and sort of reflecting on my own positionality in ways that are more common in the ethnomusicological uh, um, community. So now that you pose the question, I think there's a lot more that I could have explored in, in on that topic because it's it's also really interesting, um, but it's something I will continue to think about definitely. Thank you, and I didn't mean it in a confrontational sense. I, yeah. I just yeah. think it's fascinating um, that you you have that role that you are mm. talking about so much, um, and I think an exploration of that would be would be really interesting and productive. So I'm excited. Thank you. And it's also it's also something that um as a as an so my I'm um I'm from Norway and Norwegian is my my native language. And um there's a, a particular re relationship between Norway and Iceland as well where uh there's a um Norwegians are uh very welcome in Iceland and and um uh, there's this sense that uh when I'm there you know it's it's sort of us uh against the Americans or so you know there there's this sense that um also because there's a shared uh linguistic and and sort of um you know the languages are very similar you know, you know um and there's the shared history and there's uh, sort of we've both been uh, under Danish rule and so you know there's there's this uh, sense that, um, of course, I'm not an, an Icelander, and I would never say that, but there's also a, a certain degree of familiarity with, with the culture and the history and so forth, and, you know, certain closeness. Um, but, yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Thank you. Hmm. Okay, our next question is from Glenn. Hi, everyone. How are you doing? Uh, hi, thanks for this great talk today. I just want to quickly say also thank you for this year of amazing discussions. I'm in Ottawa, Canada, and I really appreciate this. Um, I think I'm asking sort of like the uh, the punk resentment question, maybe. And I'm just sort of wondering if there's 
if you know of any waves or movements of artists in in Iceland who have like kind of had enough and are calling it out and what kind of social criticism is mm -hmm. happening. And I, we also uh, in the chat think that destinationalism is a really great word. <laughs> uh, yeah. So in Newfoundland itself, uh, easternmost province in Canada, you know, 500,000 people uh, known for its traditions of music and identity is going through a lot of the same tourism problem, but there are just a few playwrights and performance artists uh, who are satirizing this and, you know, to their yeah. own uh, career detriment in a lot of ways, because they are, it is a small place mm -hmm. and they aren't playing along to the structure. So they aren't playing the game. So they can't call something out on a Friday night or a Saturday night and expect to get the tourist, you know, yeah. playing gigs on the Wednesday. So there's a little bit of that. Yeah. Back. I'm just wondering if, if, if that's, if you have any uh, examples of that, or it's just an interesting yeah. idea for me. And thanks for your book. I look forward to getting it in Canada. Oh, thank you so much. Um, absolutely. There is a lot of, um, there was a lot of like critical discussion now when, when I, I was in Iceland a couple of weeks ago, again, uh, coinciding with this big music festival, this annual music festival, which has really grown to become this massive showcase. Uh, and there's a lot of, critical discussions now that that this festival has really become this sort of tourist touristic thing and people are opting to not perform at the festival and and so forth and people sort of hosting their own alternative festival so there is really this and there is absolutely a punk sort of community in Iceland that's really exciting right now uh, something called postdraving um which is this um uh kind of collective record label um and short, sort of um network of very young musicians uh 18 year olds 19 year olds who are doing sort of continuing the the sort of uh Icelandic punk movement from the 80s uh, which is really where Björk cut her teeth as well in some of these uh, bands like Kuk and uh, so forth um and there, but I I think generally, people, musicians in Iceland are very understanding uh, of the need to sort of perform for tourists, um, basically because the the domestic domestic market does not sustain music. I mean, it's it's just too small. So um, Icelandic music has been has always been dependent on touring abroad and and sort of inviting guests to festivals and sort of it's never um i mean of course it, sustainable depends on what what sort of musical culture you're trying to sustain i guess but um a sort of wide diversity of uh, popular genres and so forth is 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 uh, would be hard to do if it wasn't for for um tourism industry and also for you know uh, tour, touring abroad and sort of uh, having a very international um, relationship, I think, is is key. So that that's why a lot of Icelandic artists, even the artists who are very critical of sort of this exotification and so forth, they do do understand why others do it. I guess. Thanks. Mm. Okay, and maybe we'll, if no one else has questions, we'll end with John Shaw's question. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks so much for staying up late and raving about books and music and culture. Thanks so much for the new vocabulary for me, Borealism and Desta Nationalism. Um, and thanks for the whole discussion. It's been terrific. Um, I was just wondering, hearing you talk and thinking about other writers on music and nature and other musicians who have uh, written about nature and writ and tried to incorporate thoughts of nature in their own music, uh, whether you had noted any interchange, influence, or parallels between the scientific musicians you've been talking to and studying and such other northern or borealistic uh, musicians as the Alaska composer John Luther Adams, who is very involved with in his in his music making, or uh, the Canadian pianist uh, 
Glenn Gould, who I believe did radio, uh, yeah. radio programs about the North, um, yeah. or or Toru Takamitsu of Japan, so, mm. Uh, mm. very involved with music and nature. Uh, though I don't know how mm. borealistic his approach has been. Mm. I'm just wondering. That's, yeah, no, this is a great question actually because there is a lot of. Um, aesthetic similarities in many of the contemporary Icelandic composers who are deliberately trying to uh, work with ideas of ecology and to sort of evoke um, landscapes and so forth. There is a lot of similarities to people like John Luther Adams. Um, you know, aesthetically, there's this, you know, just the, the durational thing you know the sense of time the sense of space the use of register the use of um sort of wide open spaces in the music um both in the um sort of orchestral music of someone like Anna Thorvaldsdóttir also in the music of Hildur Gunnadóttir uh but also in something like the music of Sigros and you know their classic albums including Auge Tispirion where there really is this deliberate pacing this sort of minimalist aesthetic um always this slow tempo and the the lack of events in the music and the lack of rhythm um just sort of op opening up and taking letting the music unfold very gradually things like that so there seems to be some certain common parameters that composers are working with in across sort of northern locations uh, at least iceland and canada um when when trying to sort of think about um nature in their music which is interesting because that's just one one idea one conception of what nature might be or what nature might sound like and it's a very specific type of landscape right uh which is uh globally speaking is quite rare i guess you know that's those are not the musical parameters that you would work with if you're trying to evoke a sort of rainforest or a sort of you know a different type of environment so there's there's something about and also i do briefly in this in a couple of the chapters actually i, I return to an idea of coldness as an aesthetic so there's a lot of shared there's a lot of similarities in music that tries to sound cold. You know, their use of high frequency metallic percussion, sort of twinkly sounds, bells, uh, and sort of you know uh, those sort of things, and sort of certain string sounds, and 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 that's also something that I can hear in the music of John Luther Adams and others. Um, so there are definitely a range of musical details that tend to show up in in across uh northern musics i guess thanks so much that that's fascinating hmm. thanks so much tori and alexis this is just a, an amazing conversation i learned so much and um thanks to all of you for coming today um I uh, just want to remind you that our new season will begin on January 8th on, and we'll switch to Mondays um, with Lene Denise's book, Why Willie Mae Thornton Matters. Um, so stay tuned for more details on that and on the schedule as we get that coming. But for now, um, good night to our folks who are probably getting sleepy and have a great evening rest of the December, all of you and happy holidays. Okay. Happy new year. Bye.